going back to the brand standards, that is your that is your baseline for everything that you do. You have your fonts, your colors, um, you know the how your your marketing voice sounds to a customer. Uh, all those things drive integrated marketing and the consistency and that um, uh, just leads to strengthening your brand. And again, it's that recall for the customer of, you know, when they see those colors or they see that logo, what that means to them. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Modern Car Wash podcast. I am your host, Kevin Zelaznik, and I say that with some hesitation because today, if you're watching on YouTube uh, or the video stream of this, you'll notice that I'm actually in the guest chair. Um, we've decided to kind of shift things around uh, within the, the podcast space, and uh, I would like to say I'm moving on to greener pastures, but I'm not even sure if that's the right term. So I am joined today with Dan St. Jock, who is the marketing manager um, for Hoffman Development. And even more specifically, he handles Innovate's uh, marketing efforts. Uh, so he will be taking over the reins of this podcast. Maybe I can talk my way back into it one, one way or another, but we shall see. So uh, I guess without further ado, your new host, Dan St. Jock. Dan, Thanks for joining us and kind of taking over here. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, I guess I'll still wear the host hat for the beginning part of the show, but we did want to talk marketing um, because it's certainly uh, a very important part of any organization. Um, but before we do that, let's get to know you a little bit. Uh, your background, you've been with our company for four years, and I think I saw a sign today. Your yeah. your four year anniversary is actually uh, month. this month. Yeah. So, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so my background actually really, and I'll let you tell it on your side too. But it's actually in collegiate athletics and in sports. Um, really, that was my communications experience. Um, so I worked with at Skidmore College Union uh, with the Albany Devils a little bit, and then. As life things change happen, kind of realize that looking for kind of a different path of life, just in terms of a kind of a work life balance. And then, um, you know, wanted to make the shift into marketing and saw this role here. And again, as the stars align, we can kind of talk about that. Yeah. I ended up here, but um, ended up finding this position and really it, it encompasses a lot of different things and a lot of the kind of the skills and all that, that was developed you know, through athletics and was able to apply it here. So, um, like I said, been here for four years working with Hoffman development and took over the innovative side of things in April. Yeah. I, I think, um, you know, without like going back and forth, like question, answer, question, answer, I think, uh, uh, our paths are very similar. Um, so I, I worked after graduating from college, I worked in athletics as well. And that's kind of where, how we've met, um, so I went from Syracuse university to union college. And then from union college, I made the jump to professional hockey. And eventually after, I don't know, seven years, I was the v vice president of communications for the Albany devils, who was the, uh, the minor league affiliate of the New Jersey devils. But during my path there, you interned for us, um, in the communications department. And then uh, I remember we offered you a job for something else just because you were such a good worker and we liked having you and you and I, you turned that down because your your passion was in communications marketing. Um, so you went to Skidmore, you went to Union, we had the same job at Union. And then very similar to me, you know, sports is a 24 hour type job, uh, and especially when you work in PR and I don't think people realize this is that you're you're this bridge between the team and everyone else and that goes uh it extends beyond just like newspapers or the TV stations it's you know it's logistics it's it's a lot right and I think what happens is that role people kind of always you're always around and people kind of lean on you for things kind of out side of your scope of work and 
that turns into a 50, 60, 70, 80 hour work week. And when you're in your late twenties or whatever, and you have a kid, uh, you have your first child, your perspectives change, that lifestyle doesn't work out. Um, and for me, I was fortunate enough to, this job became available. Uh, and I learned about it through a rep, a TV rep and start working here. I was here for, I don't know, six, seven months. And then you were deciding to make a change and you saw, we were hiring and you saw the post and the rest is history. Now you're hosting a podcast. Like, <laughs> that's, it's just funny how it's, it works, right? It's weird how it works. And I will say that initially turning down that job with the Albany Devils was like one of the hardest decisions to make because my goal had always been to get into sports. Yeah. And so here was this opportunity, but it wasn't in the exact field I was in. So I say, does this pigeonhole you? Does it move you out what you're focusing on? Mm -hmm. Do you stick with what you're doing? Because at this time, coming out of school, I was working at Enterprise, yeah. working there. And that, those work hours are like the same thing. It's like a 45 or 48 hour work week. And then using my vacation time then, because through, a ser again, a weird series of connections, my wife ends up getting in touch with um, the CEO of the, of the Albany Devils. Yeah. Somehow gets in touch with me. This whole thing kind of <laughs> spirals that way. It's so weird how it happens. Um but again, so, you know, but that was, that was kind of the goal always to get into sports and there was this opportunity and I was like, it wasn't quite where I wanted to be. So, yeah. um, you know, put that time with enterprise, put that time in there and then all of a sudden <laughs> it circles back. So you yeah. never know. It's, you know, it's the values of those experiences and the, again, people that you meet, it's important. Yeah. And obviously you were always somebody that I admired and looked up to and then just this opportunity happened. It's kind of just, it is, it's really weird how it yeah. kind of followed that, that parallel path. But it, here we are. It's, it's just like, it's just so crazy how, um, uh, I remember when we were hiring for the job within this department, like I, you were at union and I, I think I was driving home and I'm just trying to think like, we didn't have like great candidates. We had a few and it was just like, yeah. And I thought to myself, I'm like, oh, I wonder what Dan's up to, like how Dan's <laughs> doing. Right. And I'm like, Oh, you know what? Like I knew your passion was in sports. And then you reached out maybe 48 hours later. Again, I think, Jenna was pregnant. Yeah. Your wife was yeah. pregnant at the yeah. time. And um, so the rest is history. Start so here we are. Yeah. yeah. Well, Kevin Slasic, welcome to the Modern Car Wash <laughs> podcast. Let's get into it a little Thank bit you. with you here. Thanks. Um, so as you said, I mean, so you come into this job and you started, it was January, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, January right? 20, 2017. Yeah. 20, yep. Yeah, right. Yep. So you come in. So what's that? What does that look like for you as you make that transition? So kind of your first spot on the job. Yeah. That's it's not you're not right in the office in front of a computer diving no. right into it. How did that look for you? Yeah. Kind of so get started here. It was interesting because, uh, again, going back to the communications background, like more working in sports and specifically in, in PR like that. Um, it, it was a, half my job was operations. Half my job was promoting the team through, you know, the website, through relationships with newspapers, televisions, more on the reporting side and not necessarily marketing. I was involved in, in the overview of the marketing scope of the team, but not like in the nitty gritty of it. Um, so I'm not going to let probably coming into a Hoffman car wash specifically in Hoffman Jiffy Lube as well, you know, it was, they were a, an established brand in, in the market. The Jiffy Lubes are lights out, top three Jiffy Lubes in the country as far as volume. And I stepped in and I'm thinking to myself, like, don't screw it up. And also there was there was a bit of like imposter syndrome. Like I didn't necessarily know if I fit um, just because it was all so new sure. to me. Um, but, and part of that is you have to learn. And the more knowledge you get, the more comfortable you experience. So, uh, and kudos. So Ron Sloan, president of the company, you know, hires, I think I made a decision late November, early December, you know, you're going to start on January 2nd. Um, but you're, you're not even going to really see the office for the first week. So I worked, uh, so January 2nd in upstate New York, it's, you know, 10 degrees outside and I'm greeting customers. I'm, I'm vacuuming cars I'm pulling cars on. I got a full full service experience on day one. I think day two, I was in the loops doing the same thing. So you actually like you go into it, and you, you see what the operation is like, how the interactions with the customers are. I didn't even know our wash lineup. I, I didn't know any of this stuff. And as much as you try and do your research during an interview, it's just 
it was very much overwhelming. But when I look back on that, it's important because it's very easy to, you know, uh, to say, yeah, you know, eventually I'll figure out like what we do. But when you actually are interacting with the customer or towel drying or whatever it is, you, you see what's happening kind of feet on the ground. You did the same thing uh, when you started. Um, we just hired another marketing person. He not maybe as intensive as our experiences, um, but same thing. And then Lauren, who kind of produces this podcast sitting over there, she probably would have done the same thing if she didn't start the day that we shut down <laughs> for, for <laughs> right. the pandemic. Right. So um, you see that it's kind of a practice that we've we've kind of done here, not just in the marketing department, but you see it across uh, all departments here. Sure. And how important is that, do you think, for to not necessarily be working in the stores, but how important do you think it is to spend that time in the stores to see those operations and how they're going and get to know people? How valuable is that yeah. uh, for you when you're in charge here? Well, there, there's so many levels to it. Uh, it's, you know, is it the, the interactions with the customers part of it? Is it just how the store is laid out and the signage and the, uh, the, the brand within the, like your, your, um, your property, um, just getting a good sense of that where you started. I remember interviewing and one of the things that I point, I noticed and I brought it up in the interview is that our garbage, our trash cans have our logoed and they're done it's very tasteful the way that we do it um you notice those attention to details and things like that and then that translates into how you're trying to market uh the company to the masses it's funny you say i, I remember you saying that to me i was actually going to bring that up with you because i remember you mentioning that to me being like you're going through it was the our our village full service car wash and seeing that seeing the logo on there and that was a moment as you're kind of preparing and going through this and interviewing for this job where you're like okay, this is big, like this is serious operation. Yeah. This is serious attention to detail, which is something that obviously is very important to you in the way that you run the show too. Um, it's funny that you remember, I remember you saying that detail. It's it's a small thing that you wouldn't necessarily think about yeah. in the grand scheme of marketing, like where does that fall? But it's that attention to detail that makes it so right. important, you know, that makes everything else kind of run so smoothly. Right. I, and it's like, you know, I, I knew, I'm not from the area, and but I lived in the area for, at that point, uh, nine years. So I knew Hoffman right. car wash. Like that's where you right. got your car wash. You didn't, but you, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, I didn't necessarily know that the Jiffy Lube was, a, it was the same company. I, I, I knew that you get your oil changed at the Jiffy Lube, you get a free Hoffman car wash. And when you're, you know, 24, 25 years old, and you're making no money, mm -hmm. you have no money. Like, getting a free car wash is a pretty <laughs> sweet deal. Right. So that was my like experience with Hoffman car wash. And, you know, you don't, I don't really think anything of it. And then when you start to learn about the company, you know, all right, well, it's not just that one store that you go to. In fact, it's 18 different right. stores and, Oh, it's not just that Jiffy lube. It's, you know, at the time, 10 other Jiffy yeah. lubes. Oh, and by the way, you have the top three Jiffy lubes in the country and you have five in the top 10. Like, you're like, all right, well, like, you know, being in sports, and I'm sure you felt the same way, like the ultimate goal was to make it to the major leagues. Sure. And that's what I felt like as close as I was in my sports career, that's what I felt like I was stepping into. Even though I was shifting, I felt like I was stepping into an organization that was in the major leagues. Um, and, you know, it, there's pressure there i guess because you're stepping into a role that you're trying now to to match that uh that level of execution and then take it even further um so i get i don't know i don't know where I'm exactly right. i'm going but it goes back to that like right. still having that imposter syndrome when i started just like sports it's one thing to get to the top staying there is another thing yeah. which then that pressure is on like you're saying you know once you've built that brand up to be there well now the expectation is you're there so yeah. if you take one step back like that's that's a pretty hard spot to be in as a right. marketer to say you're already on top so yeah. now staying there year after year how do you make that yeah. happen i guess is always a challenge yeah for sure and i mean really you you i think the important thing is um is to kind of just play to your strengths like i knew what my strengths were at the time and if i can highlight those i could work on my weaknesses and kind of build it up and you know for me i think attention to detail was a thing and so i tried to play off that 
It's funny, you know, you look at specifically, I guess a lot of things, but in marketing, marketing, part of marketing is very much like that creative side of things and design. And uh, our director of operations sent me a text on Tuesday because there was a flyer that showed up for a free car wash. And he was like, you know, what is this? And it was actually from, we opened a store like, I don't know, four months after I started and we did a free car wash offer and we sent these flyers out and the, I'm just looking at it. I'm like, I can't believe like I created that. <laughs> right. Like it was, um, but at the time it, you, it, in my mind, and maybe it did look good at the right. time, but you know, as you evolve and as you grow and you, you pick things up, uh, you know, we wouldn't put up, put that piece of crap out today. <laughs> um, but at the time, you know, it I apparently worked and it got approved. So, I mean, Jenko jeans look good at, well, at a time, right? So, I mean, <laughs> and you know, they'll come back probably. <laughs> yeah. uh, and we'll circle back to that opening. So I want to kind of go back to talking about opening that first store, but we'll kind of work through a little bit chronologically here. So you go, you spend your first week in the stores. Yep. So now you're into that week in January. And as anybody in our company will tell you or knows, February is generally the year-end meeting from the year <laughs> yeah. prior, the yeah, recap yeah. of the prior year. Yeah. And that is a production. Yeah. Now you're going into this blind, not understanding really this yeah. production. So that's something that maybe you don't necessarily think about you know, from the outside as it's going to fall on the responsibility of the market. But here it is now. Yeah. You have this on your plate. What was that sort of like? Yeah. Is that, that's a show. So, and again, it goes back to kind of the, the, the organization as a whole and kind of being in that major league category, you know, you could have a, you know, send everyone to a restaurant and have a good time. Our end of the year, like, it's like an Apple keynote address, <laughs> right? Like, maybe not to that extent, but. You know, we rent out this big hall. There's a stage. There's video. There's presentations. There's music. Two years ago, we had like a light show. Like it's it is a production, and you're trying to not only manage the you know your day to day and driving business for the for the car wash, Jiffy Loop, every company. Then you have to go and put this. Uh, presentation on and at the time the marketing department was three people um and the there's always a theme to it um it's a, it's it takes a lot of work and ignorance was bliss that first year and i my wife was invited we normally it's just you know our managers and staff uh spouses aren't typically invited but since i was new and our H, director of hr was new our spouses came to uh, got to be there and I remember just kind of showing up and uh, you know the other two members of the marketing department kind of we, we, we kind of we, we were we were buttoned up we had everything lined up and then you know I sat down ate dinner and the show went on and then I don't know two weeks later a month later whatever or as you get closer to the next year you realize kind of how big it, of a production it is and how big of a uh, um, a deal it is for for everyone involved you know uh and you're celebrating the previous year so that first year was very much like oh you know enjoy my chicken and you know sit back and relax well the second year completely high stress situation <laughs> like you can't even t look at your yeah. food um and i think your first year you you were on paternity yeah. leave right so right. but you came it was important yeah. for you to see it so i remember you coming and i remember like feeling so stressed out. And I, I think I remember looking at you being like, man, Dan's got it. Dan was exactly where I was a year ago. Um, yeah, but it, I, again, I go, it goes back to the, the organization and the professionalism and kind of that, you know, being a, a major league company. So uh, whether other companies do it or not, I think... Uh, I think it's a nice touch for our managers and our staff. And it's a good way to kind of reflect on the year you had. Um, and luckily for the past four or five years, even before we were here, uh, it's been a, a success story uh, being told up there. Right. So it's nice to give that recognition to the people who are really working out there in the stores sure. and get yeah. the managers to see that. And I yeah. know they obviously appreciate it too. Yeah. Um, so moving past that though, so you get through February, get through your end meeting. Now on the other side of that, 
opening the first store in three years, four, 2014, yeah, I think it was right? 2014, yeah, uh, yeah. That's right. So, so th- three the, years had passed. The first new location is yeah. going to open in three years, and it's state of the art facility. It's really different than any other store yeah. that's been open. You got you're using tellers there, free vacs are there. So now you're thrown into this situation, preparing for that. What does what does that look like for you in marketing that as you get prepared to open a new location? Yeah, again, ignorance is bliss, I guess. Um, you had so much going on, learning so much, and, and I will I'll give uh, Ron a lot of credit. Like you know, he he was very good at kind of guiding me through these things and kind of what to expect. Um, and that store, kind of. If you look at the stores that we've built since then or are going to build, that is kind of the model that mm-hmm. we've followed is the way it looks and the layout of the property equipment we use. Um, it's funny because when I look back at it, it's I don't really remember too much about it. Um, I know at the time, like the unlimited program was important, but it's not it wasn't as important or as we weren't focusing on it. Um, like we are now, it was our first really teller lo- exterior tunnel teller mm-hmm. location. And, you know, we had our screens and that was it. And we had, you know, it, it, it's just funny to look back at that, that location and, and think, I forget how many unlimited members we signed up over like the first couple months. And then now fast forward to our next store, which I believe was in Binghamton yeah. in 2018. Yeah. Um, how much had changed in the company since then, as far as our growth, of the limited, our prioritizing of the limited and our prioritizing of tellers um, and how that, that has evolved over time as well. Um, I think with grand openings, it's, it's, um, it's it always happens way faster than you think it's a big deal i mean you're you're launching a store um sometimes in a new market um it could be stressful uh and i think it i think it goes back to just my style as a a, a marketer or a manager or whatever it is is the more you're prepared you are the more it's going to succeed right the, the more buttoned up you are, you're going to see that success. Um, and I know sometimes it's a struggle because, you know, maybe something falls to the crack and you have to pivot quickly. Um, but luckily, like, you know, we have a good team here and, and, and can make those changes. Um, but back to that store in 2017, I just, again, I, I don't remember too much of it. Um, I remember feeling like, uh, I did what I had to do, mm-hmm. but I, I don't know. Again, I think ignorance was bliss and didn't really, never really landed on how big of a deal it really was. So in thinking back, on it, how much were you involved in the actual sort of, um, in deciding what the promotion is going to look like, how we're going to, you know, how we're going to market this or was that already kind of put in front of you and like, uh, go ahead and execute this plan? Basically? It was, it was, I would say 80% like here's, uh, again, going back to Ron, Ron has a ton of experience, has uh, has kind of seen it all. And secretly, I think like he's an operations guy, but secretly, I think he like he loves the marketing. I think he loves right. the that. So um, not secretly, he has good <laughs> ideas, right? He's he kn- he kind of knows what works. So it was very much like we're open the store. Here's what we should do. Go do it. Um, and then I was able to kind of well, I think we should try this or, or that. Um, looking back on, on it and kind of when we opened the next store and then even the store this past year, I would put that as we probably failed in launching that store. Um, if you were to compare how we've, I don't know, succeeded in the last two, um, and we got to keep doing it over and over and over again, cause we're just building stores left and right here. Mm-hmm. So just to backtrack a little bit now, so. Uh, you know, to quote office space here, because I think marketing is such a broad term. And I think yeah. it means probably in different companies means a lot of different things. If you're a director of marketing, what does that responsibility look like? But what do you do here? What is it would you say you do here? Or at least what did that look like oh, when you came in here? Because under this umbrella, and I, you know, listeners may not all know, 
that it's not just Hoffman Car Wash, like you touched on before. It's Jiffy Lube. It's also By Rider. Yeah. And then after you've been here for two years or whatever, two or three years, a whole other company is formed yeah. and innovate it. And now there's a fourth company that's under this umbrella. Yeah. And, you know, you're not necessarily staffed the way to cover all that. So what does that respond? What does your responsibility sort of look like at that? Point? What do you, do you want me to talk about like how it's changed or like what it did look like and what it looks yeah, like what, now? What did it look like at least at that point? Because um, I would say that it has always been a bit of controlled chaos. Um, and I think more so now, more so today than maybe five years ago, four years ago. Um, I think the, I think what we've been not, and this isn't just the marketing department. I think this is a, the company as a whole is that we've been able to raise, um, our expectations. Um, I look back at things that I was doing five years ago and stressing about, and it's not even really on my radar today just because we have so much going on and almost at a much larger scale. Um, you know, again, I go back the flyer when we opened the store, you know, I remember stressing about that and, you know, maybe had four or five different designs. Not that we don't do multiple designs yeah. on something, but now it's like, we're, we're so, we have it honed in that we know kind of what it should look like, what it should feel. You know, there's no brand standards when I got here. Um, and for the most part, we didn't have brand standards up until, I don't know, a year or two years ago, right. because, you know, for the most part, it, it was just you and mm -hmm. I, and we knew, all right, we know this is the font, this is the colors, whatever it is. Um, now, it's, I think it's just a striving to see more consistency. But uh, I always think, you know, looking back and kind of like, oh, man, it was easy back in those days, right? <laughs> um and as our department's grown and there's there's different ways you can approach marketing um and it depends on you know the if you're a car wash operator and you have one store you don't have maybe you don't have a marketing department and you have to work on work through vendors or local agencies whatever it is well i always take i've always felt uh, and what I've strived for is that we are the agency for the company. That's how we approach it. Um, the stores are our customers. Our district managers are our customers. Um, our, if we're doing HR recruiting, the HR department, they're our customers. So we're our own little agency um, within the company. Uh, and that's how we try and run it. Um, so with that, like, your mindset is that okay like i'm running this agency you know i'm not i'm not my job isn't creating this flyer it's running a su successful agency that's going to drive sales that's going to push unlimited membership it's going to push oil changes it's going to sell cars it's going to sell car wash equipment um so it's uh our mentality has certainly changed over the last five years for sure as much as so you look at the disc you talk about you know the district managers being a client, HR being a client. How important is that collaboration as well? Because obviously you lean on the district yeah. when you when it comes to kind of the higher level strategy. You know you're leaning on the district managers to understand what's happening at a store level yep. that you can then impact. Yeah. And you know I think about our IT department. You know you have to lean on IT for a lot of different. I mean a ton of different things yep. from teller screens, reporting, all that. So how important is that collaboration internally to make everything else a success? It, it it's the most important thing. Um, and I'm not being like, uh, uh, facetious or whatever. Like it really is. You need to, you need to have a good line of communications and I enjoy working with every single one of my coworkers. There's not like, I, I don't have a single issue with anyone. Um, and that just, it helps you want to, it helps you excel or speed up, um, and reach your goals even faster, you know? we talked about this on this podcast before I think when Tommy was on is that this building is, it was built for that collaboration. Um, I know our audience can't see it, but if you look out these windows right here, the marketing department sits right there, there's like a half wall and then the district managers are on the other side of that. And, uh, being able to be in one spot as a marketing team and just being able to talk and openly communicate, 
uh, I think helps spur ideas, just kind of keeps us on track, but also being able to just pop over and have the conversation with the district manager of like, hey, like, you know, they might be saying, uh, you know, our, our customers are struggling with this teller screen. All right, well, what can we change? And then now you're getting IT involved and you're collaborating with IT and then it's going back to the district managers, going to the store. You know, we all have the same goal here. Uh, my goal isn't to, to um, you know, one day uh, sell the, you know, have the marketing department acquired by some private equity company. You know what right. I mean? Like our our goal is to, to within this building is to, uh, to help our managers succeed at what they do at the store level. Um, and I think everyone kind of buys into that. Right. And I mean, that's not just external as well, because you rely on district managers internally, promotions, those sort of yeah. things. How do you support your stores? Yeah. Um, and I think and, obviously that's a vital, vital piece of it. And a lot of it, and the, there's, you know, with your district managers, there's a, uh, uh, and, and our, our company is kind of the hierarchy or the flow is that you have your store managers goes into the district managers and the district managers work cross departments on whatever, whatever it is. Um, the, uh, so you, you kind of lean on the district managers for their feedback. Um, uh, I, I'm completely blanking. I forgot what your question was. <laughs> You're talking about leaning on them for in, internal oh, promote, yeah. We're supporting the stores well, themselves. And, the other and, thing too is that our company, we're very fortunate that, you know, our district managers, you know, you have like 20, 30 years experience right. each. Um, and I look at a guy like Dave Brooks. Dave Brooks is our um, director of operations, been with the company I don't know, 20 plus mm -hmm. years has seen it all, has worked every job. You know, he's someone who I rely on very much just to bounce ideas off of, or we'll, um, uh, or he'll come to me and say, Hey, what do you want to try this idea? Uh, again, it goes back to that collaboration. Um, but the, sometimes the, the lines do get blurred as far as, you know, all right, we're going to do you know, when you think of marketing, you think of very much external, right. you know, uh, well, we're going to, we're going to do a, uh, we're going to change our commission for our creators because we're trying to drive this product or whatever it is. Well, then we marketing kind of gets involved and, you know, we'll give our two cents at the end of the day kind of falls on the district managers, uh, what they want to do and how can we support that? So, um, you know, it's, they're the sales part of the, the business, we're the marketing part of the business. And uh, whether you're car wash, uh, car dealership, you're selling software, whatever it is, if you don't have a good relationship with your sales and marketing, you're, you're not going to succeed. I want to circle back to something you touched on. You talked about putting in, putting brand standards into place yeah. finally a year or whatever it was, finally yeah. that was actually established. Um, just talk about that evolution a little bit about the actual marketing of Hoffman Car Wash because you're involved in a lot of things. Your hands are still very much in the dirt from a design standpoint, from those like, that was something that you set up. So how, how important is that? Because I know um, when Justin Alford was on, he was talking about for Benny's, they were redesigning everything for all their stores in any location. And when they were putting in a new sign or anything was going in, they had a specific design person. Everything yeah. flowed through him so that anything that was created followed all those standards. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, right now with the new locations that are being built, locations that are being kind of retrofitted or um, renovated. There's a lot of those happening within the company yeah. as well. Um, how important is that to set up the brand standards and how does that kind of look for you making yeah. those changes? Well, I think, you know, if, if you're a car wash operator and you can, um, again, it goes back to, are you using event, like are you using an agency or do you have your own in-house marketing and what brand standards do it, whichever way you go is that, uh, and maybe your agency is developing your brand standards for you is that you now have the framework how to um, to build upon. And what I mean by that is just the consistency. Um, you don't want it, your colors changing because your colors mean something to your customers or your potential customers. Your logo means something. If you change your logo every, you know, three years, two years, like everything that you did before that kind of goes falls by the wayside because you have to you have to um, kind of rebrand yourself you know I think one of the struggles we still have to this day is that you know 
we do have uh, so many locations and we have signs out there that I don't even know exist. It happens all the time. I get, hey, can we get this new sign? Well, it's like, all right, I definitely didn't make that sign. And that's from, you know, eight years ago. Um, so we're, we're trying, we're constantly trying to build to um, uh, being more consistent. Uh, but even if you look at your properties, our new properties versus versus our older properties, the buildings look different. That goes a long way. And now we're going back and we're, we're renovating these buildings and we're we're trying, the, the property is, ne- is part of the brand and we're trying to kind of bring it up to um, uh, where we are today with our newer stores. But the, the going back to the brand standards, that is your, that is your baseline for everything that you do. You have your fonts, your colors, um, you know, the, how your, your marketing voice sounds to a customer. Uh, all those things drive integrated marketing and the consistency and that um, uh, just leads to strengthening your brand. And again, it's that recall for the customer of, you know, when they see those colors or they see that logo, what that means to them. I think one of the hard parts too is, and you, and you touched on it there, is that, you know, you think about like a grocery store chain, right? You think about your customer experience in grocery stores, some of them will have the same, no matter where you are, the layout is the same, right? Every aisle is the mm-hmm. same from one store yep. to another. And it just makes it that much easier if you're a customer going from one spot to another. But here, like you mentioned, no building is the same. No lot is the same. Mm-hmm. There's stores that have tellers, some that don't. Still, you know, There's full yeah. service. There's some that have lubes attached. So all that's different. So I guess as much as you can keep that consistency, so at least part of that experience is the same, it also improves your customer experience yeah. as well because they're familiar with it. Well, it, goes back, it, it even looks at like, um, you know, how are you training your employees? Um, especially with an unlimited program and in a market like ours, and I know not everyone's like this, you know, it's possible that you could visit five different car washes, five different days because you're an unlimited member. And if the experience should be the same, um, every time you go in there. Uh, and I know that not all of our stores have tellers and, um, you know, some are your greeters is being, um, uh, is scanning your your barcode but you know all right well is what's the property look like how's the landscape what are, what are the you know uh the menu board is the menu board the same yeah it, it is like there is um that consistency is an association with what you're getting and how the customer's feeling at the end of the day um uh so it's so important. And and that was a focus for us, you know, with, we hired a director of training. We had, we, um, created that position was, you know, you had eight, 18 different managers who were maybe running their stores 18 different ways. Well, the consistency is so much key. Um, and I kind of go back to, um, I don't know if this is a good story to tell, but, you know, working in, in, at, the AHL, which is the minor leagues, the NHL, we tried to create an environment for our players that when they got caught up to the NHL, there wasn't the locker rooms looked the same, mm-hmm. the jerseys were the same, the equipment was the same. So when you got called up, there wasn't this like shock and awe of being in the NHL. That it's no different than the customer visiting multiple properties. It, it needs to be the same. It doesn't need to be a new experience for them. They know that I'm going to get my barcode scanned. I'm going to get a great car wash and I'm going to be out of there in two minutes. Um, so, but it, if they go to a different one, a, a different property or a different one of our locations, you can very much have a horrible experience and then you lose that customer. So um, I, you know, you, you marketing is, um, you have a, a, people have a general sense of marketing, but it's so much more than that. Um, how, you, you know, it's, again, it goes back to what the properties look like and how our customers are talking, or, or, or I'm sorry, how our employees interacting with the customer, that's marketing. Every one of those touch points is obviously essential yes. to the customer experience. Um, you talked about back in 2017, the change to now 
on the focus on the unlimited program. Yeah. So how, how has that changed that shift, the unlimited model? Um, how much of that and how much of that do you think was impacted kind of from last year, what that looks like now in terms of having that, yeah. that program? I think there's multiple ways you can approach an unlimited program. And I think, and there's not one way that's better than the other. I think you have to kind of identify what's good for your market. Um, there are operators who will give the unlimited program away, you know, sign up, um, you know, buy it, buy a single wash today, but we'll enroll you for three months in the unlimited program. I'm not saying it's, it's not saying that's a bad idea. I get it. You're building a habit within a customer. Um, and what we've found, and I think it's important that you're constantly analyzing and you're looking at your data and you're, you're testing things is that what we found that we've been most successful when we give the reward to our employees rather than the customer. So what does a commission payout look like, uh, for us, we, we kind of, sh- shifted philosophies at the start of 20, when was the pandemic? 2020. 2020. Um, it's like, <laughs> like it was 10 <laughs> years ago. Um, you know, we would do BOGOs and we still do them sometimes uh, or some sort of offer. Well, we looked at, all right, well, how do we incentivize our employees to really, uh, all right, let me back up. All right, no, stay with me here. So when we went to the teller model, what we found was the tellers, um, the tellers talk about the unlimited program every single time. There's no avoiding it. The customer has to move through the, the unlimited sales pitch screen. We found that the tellers were selling unlimited at rates two, three times what our greeters were. So our company is built on kind of three different buckets. Your single wash, individual wash, wash cards or books uh, as some people still work. So like a, a two for whatever, mm-hmm. 25 card, whatever it is. And then you have your unlimited program. What the tellers helped us identify w- was that our greeters, and at the time we had maybe one or two teller locations, um, our greeters were, it was easier that for them to sell an, a wash card than it was an unlimited. Um, and they were, you know, they could make more money by selling five wash cards than they could one unlimited. Okay. So we were able, again, going back to your data, we were able to see this with the tellers. And so our thought was, okay, we need to, we need to shift the focus from our greeters to really speak about the unlimited program. And that's how we structure our, our bonus program, uh, is getting away from the wash card Avenue and going to the unlimited. And I want to say it was January 1st, 2020, we made that shift and it was lights out, you know, patting ourselves on the back, high-fiving each other. And then obviously everyone else knows what happened. We lost, you know, the pandemic killed our momentum um, and started this year, you know, same philosophy. And, you know, we've grown our unlimited program probably by the end, January 1 to the end of this year. I don't know. It's going to be close to, 45, 50%. Uh, and it's really just absolutely focusing on the unlimited. And, you know, it's, it's tough because you're going to wash way more cars. You're now, now it changes your infrastructure. You know, you have to look at your staff. You have to look at your equipment. Can your equipment last that long to wash that many cars? We have one location. It was just like, Absolutely. I mean, they were a strong location and now they're, they're washing, you know, 30, 33% more cars this year than they were last year. Um, so it's not like we're, we're, that's a reason to turn away from the unlimited program is because you're washing more cars. Um, I think for anything else, it's, it's making us look at how important our employees are, how important everything else, um, associated with the unlimited program is equipment, um, you know, our hours of operation, things along those lines. Um, you know, our shift, uh, that's probably been the biggest change since I've been here is just how important the unlimited program has become. I, the unlimited program, the wash cards, when I started, it was like 50, 50 importance, right? Now 
it's 100% unlimited all day, every day. Right. You talk about shifting that reward away from technically away from the customer and to the greeter, but really yeah. your goal is that your customer is going to see that value every time they yeah. come in. And this goes back to what we just spoke about, about having the consistency across locations. An unlimited member could wash at the same store a hundred times, go to a different location one time, have a bad experience. And whether they've been a member for a month or yep. 10 years, that could be the end of it yep. for them. So it just goes back again to the importance of training when yeah. you know they're washing more consistently, more frequently, they're more familiar with you as a brand and what they expect. So You're only as good as your last experience, right? right? Uh, that the customer has. So it just puts that much more uh, importance on, again, the consistency, the training, the, you know, it's not even necessarily, you know, you talk about how important signage is or the look and feel. It's just, you know, is the there's a uh, a coke bottle sitting on the ground next to the trash can just pick it up and throw it away like that that that's marketing Mm -hmm. your property is clean a clean property is indication of how the establishment is run like you don't think that coke bottle and throwing it away is marketing it's marketing and when you talk about um well when you think about explaining that reward or demonstrating that value to your customer how do you go about that communi- that communication consistently showing them their reward or you know the value yeah. that it has? I know even if it's not in place here, I mean, what what do you see as options for tactics to consistently show people here is the value for what you've purchased yeah. throughout the whole time that they're a member? You know, what? I th- for me, um, I'm not a like a big sign guy, um, and I know it's very easy to fall into a you know oh we'll just put a sign up and show the savings or whatever it is <clears throat> for me um all right well if you're a, if you have a kiosk or a teller location how do you make your elevator pitch within three mm-hmm. seconds and we do that um we use video um more so in our unlimited pitch than anything else it's just more engaging more um uh uh you can tell more with video than you can with a, a static image. And we're actually trying to work on implementing GIFs into our tellers. And if our IT department is listening to this, like, come on, let's, <laughs> let's figure this thing out. Um, but uh, with the video, and, and it's, it's this, is, this is probably one of the things I'm most proud of since working here is how we've been able to seamless, seamlessly incorporate video into our tellers. You would think the whole thing's a video. Um, it's just the way the gradients match up with the gradients of the video. It's, you know, it took a lot of hard work and testing, and um, I, I just think it's it it looks professional. Not that we would strive for anything <laughs> else or put anything else out there. It it looks like a like a I don't know a TV studio or a large media company produced this thing, but actually it was, you know, the four people sitting in these cubicles. Um, so having that, I think certainly helps. Uh, you're able to tell your story through that video at the location. Um, you can moving graphics, you're able to touch on your value prop- proposition, uh, and then hopefully make the sale, um, from a, non-teller location now it's up to the greeters to talk about it to have that sales pitch to to kind of um to move you into that package it's it's such a good deal when you think about the dollars and cents of it and if you're washing twice a month like just buy the unlimited would you right like this isn't (laughs) the sales pitch but you know that's (laughs) what you're trying to like you're conveying that like it really is it's a value um, there's value there, but also like what you get out of it at the end of the day. And it's, it's that clean car feeling, right? Um, <clears throat> the other side of that is you have to, you have to reinforce the habit in people, um, and making sure that, you know, uh, they are using it because if they're not going to use it, they're going to cancel it because it's just a waste mm-hmm. of money. Um, again, it goes back to the experience that, at the wash and if they're getting a good car if they're get if you're putting out a good car and you have friendly staff and the property's clean it just reinforces that habit of of them coming back so uh you know we talk about 
reinforcing the habit, having people visit. I think, you know, when you move and think about the subscription based model, it's just become so common, you know, from meal services, streaming services mm-hmm. to the car wash. The harder part is those are getting delivered to people in their homes, yeah. other places for this side of things. It's more like a gym membership where you have to get people to get there. Yeah. The reward for people are, or maybe the desire for people to get to the car wash more so than the gym is yeah. probably a little easier. But how do you, you know, getting <laughs> people there, how do you make that consistently yeah. happen? You know, yeah. I look at, I'm a huge fan of email marketing. I think it's one, it's probably the most important channel uh, or medium that we use to talk to our customers. We're not quite there yet with the unlimiteds, and part of the unlimited pro, pro probably the, part of the unlimited um, program that we struggle with is we don't have good contact information for our customers. Uh, we're doing better. Um, we do try and collect an email address now when you sign up. So, if in a perfect world, this is how it would work for me: you sign up for the unlimited program, you get it. We collect an email address. <clears throat> you wash your car. You get an email that says, thanks for joining, like whatever, blah, blah, blah. Two days later, you get an email address. Here's how to get the most out of your car wash, your unlimited mm-hmm. membership. And you could talk about like, okay, form a habit. Well, how do you form a habit? Well, you need a trigger. What's your trigger? Driving to work every day, I drive by a Hoffman car wash. When I see that Hoffman car wash, that's my trigger. I'm going to pull in and get my car wash. So now you've you've started uh, a habit for them, but it, on the email side of things, you've you've started a journey for them. Um, so you know, after two days or a, a week later, maybe you send them another email about I don't know. Maybe it's a um, social proof. It's reviews of like, mm. hey. Here are other people just like you. This is what this is how they feel, you know, about the unlimited program. And maybe you collect maybe it's a survey like how's your experience going so far? It's that constant those like just subtle emails every once in a while um, that keep you top of mind that hopefully reinforce that usage and then at the end of the month you get an email saying Hey, you, you know, you've been in the program for one month. You wash X amount of time. Here's how much you saved and, and so forth. Um, in a perfect world, that's how it works. Right. Um, and I think that's what we're kind of striving to, but if you can, uh, you know, it's just a matter of people not, I think it's easy for people and we'll use the gym membership side of things is that, I don't even know if that's fair. Like people do like going to the gym, but it, you're there the 30 minutes. Yeah. It's not the same <laughs> it's way. It's not the same way. But the the struggle for gyms is like you you need people to use. Well, I guess gyms probably look at it in two ways is that you want people to show up and use it. And that's probably why they offer free classes mm-hmm. or whatever it is. But there's probably part of them who are okay if people don't use it and just kind of sit it, set it and forget it. Mm-hmm. And a year later, they realize they still have a gym membership and they do, then they finally turn it off. I don't think that's our approach at all. We want people to use it. Sure. Um, and it's just a matter of reinforcing that. It might be as simple as, you know, the greeter who scans your thing, giving you a wave, knowing your name, making it a friendly environment and be like, hey, see you tomorrow. Right. Well, see you tomorrow. Yeah, I can come back tomorrow. And so email marketing, obviously, is a probably the best way to stay in touch with those customers. Yeah. And obviously, like you said, collecting that email can obviously be a little bit more of a struggle, but uh, people are probably more inclined to give just an email address now more than anything else. Yeah. But how else do you go about, or what's another way you can find to grow your email list from a, from a standpoint, non unlimited members. I know beyond just saying sign up for our email list, here's a free car wash, which then leaves you open to yeah. just, you know, spam yeah. emails or body emails yeah. basically going through there. Um, how else can you go about growing that and expanding that side of it? Because obviously it's a valuable tool. Yeah. Well, I, I will say this um, and kind of to pull back a little bit. Email marketing is, again, our number one um, channel that we talk to our customers. Um, I've noticed that our open rates, click-through rates, are going down and I get it people it's just it's 
it's not like people all of a sudden are going to like, oh, you know what? I do like to get these promotional emails, right. not just for my, you just see the, the fatigue. It seems like there's more fatigue now than there was six months ago, a year, whatever. So will email marketing always be our focus or our number one thing? Probably not. All right. Well, should we look into a text message club? The text message club is going to guarantee probably 86% open rate. Uh, you know people are going to see it. I struggle with text messaging because it's so heavily regulated. You can get into real trouble real fast if you're not setting it up properly. So email is still, you know, for that reason, kind of the way to go. But, you, you know, we have to look and we have to find what's the next best thing out there. Uh, it, even like, oh, you're like, okay, well, maybe it's not an email. Maybe it's an app. Right. We're going to have an app. Well, people have app fatigue now, too. I think what was so appealing about an app app uh, early on was like a push notification. Right. It's the same thing as a text message. It's just, you're not having these opt ins, whatever it is. Well, now people don't want so many apps on their phone and how you get people to download the app. So um, but I digress. Um, for us, there's there's a few ways you can go about emails. I, one of the big sources of email collection for us is through our our, um, our oil change services. Um, it's just easier for us to to contact uh, customers. Um, there's other things. I would really don't buy an email list. You, you can do it. It's not great. You're not going to get. You're not the the what you're going to pay for it. You're not going to get the return. Um, and again, again, it, it's maybe not necessarily about the quantity of emails that you have. It's the quality of what you're putting out. If you're emailing every single day with what, what are you offering? Right. People are just going to ignore you. And eventually your open rate and your click rate is just going to continue to go down. So you have to find your, the value uh, for that customer to open that email. You have to have a good enough offer for them to uh, open up the email because it's, again, it's all about attention. And, you know, what's, if I have, you know, I don't even look at my Gmail anymore because I feel like it's, I don't even know how I got on so many lists, <laughs> right? So, and on top of that, you're in Gmail. Now you have your like four different tabs and am I even going to go to the promotion tab? And if I do, what's going to stand out to me? And if you're just constantly emailing, people are just going to quickly find no value in it and they're they're going to get rid of it. You know, for the most part, you know, we'll do promote like a Father's Day promotion or whatever it is. That's really the only time we're emailing about the car wash. A lot of it is driven by the, the oil change services and Jiffy Loops. Um, so again, then I guess email kind of expands over multiple different channels, but um you just have to find value in, in what you're offering. And, and I think the, the signups will come, you know, you can't, you can do, I guess, email addresses. One of the things that we do uh, are not email free car washes. Um, we'll happily give a free car wash for an email address. Um, if it's a legit email address, there's ways people can abuse that. So, I think what we've found is partnering with other organizations, um, you know, we'll go back to a gym membership, right? Or a gym, uh, partner with that gym and say, Hey, we want to give your members a free car wash. All right. Well, we have systems in place where we can send those customers to a specific, um, we'll call it the ABC gym we can send it to ABC Jim's landing page. We can collect information there. And then once you hit submit, that email address is associated with a unique barcode or QR code that can then be redeemed at a car wash um, for a free car wash. By putting that landing page, maybe not open to the public, but through a separate mm -hmm. channel, we see that the abuse is, uh, has gone way down. So. Um, we're more inclined to do something like that. Yeah. As, as you mentioned, you know, you don't want to be emailing for the sake of emailing at that yes. point. Um, and, you know, the more information you can pull from your sort of engaged customers. So whether that's, you know, the opportunity to 
use e-commerce if you have that, you know, mm -hmm. if you have the infrastructure to have that set up. Obviously, if you're already showing buyers with intent to buy who have purchased something. And if you're selling your online program, your unlimited program online, I mean that then you'll see that yep. there. But also if you're not, then you can see, you know, these are customers who are very potential, you know, high potential customers to one, engage with your brand, two, to be ones that would flip yeah. over to um, unlimited. So I think that's kind of, and I, I think you you can't just email the same message to everybody all day, right. every day. It right. just doesn't make sense. Right. You know, you have to be, you know, obviously the more personalized it can be, um, the more you can follow the sort of engaged, you know, the engaged customers through the process. Right. It probably just only, only strengthens what you're, you know, your marketing efforts that way. It's all about personalization, right? Um, and a, a good example would be, uh, I'll look at our Jiffy Loops and through the software that we use, we have the ability to identify the vehicle that you drive and then not, you know, we're not building out every single make and model of a car, but I can look and say, all right, Dan, it's been 110 days since Dan's last oil change. Oh, Dan drives a, a, a sedan. Well, I'm going to send an email with a picture of a sedan to Dan. Right. Um, and if you can include their name, even better. Any information that is not um, like creepy, yeah. like if you're like, <laughs> right. why do you have my right. social security right. number? Right. Like that, yeah. you know what yeah. I mean? Like, you know, name, hey, we noticed that you're, um, you know, you're whatever, make model this year was last service, whatever. The more personalized you can make it, the the better you're, the more success that you're going to have. Um, and we always go back to, um, testing a b testing all right well, what's the subject line look like are people more uh will they open an email that has an emoji in it if they have x amount of words in the subject line like all of these things will impact whether or not your email gets opened i for one always thought that a car wash email because a car wash is something that uh you could get if you're not an unlimited member a car wash, you're probably getting a car wash at least once a month. Or you have, you look at your car and you think to yourself, mm. at least once a month, <laughs> I need a car wash, right? Maybe it's twice a month, three times a month, four times, whatever it is. An oil change, on the other hand, is something that you get once or twice, maybe three times a year. I'm always fascinated that any time that we send out an email about the car wash, and then maybe two weeks later, we send out a, a Jiffy Lube email, that Jiffy Lube email outperforms the car wash email every time. And it just, I, it's, and I know there's more of an offer in the Jiffy Lube, like some sort of coupon where, where the uh, car wash offers maybe just, you know, promoting a Father's sure. Day gift or whatever it is. But for whatever reason, I always thought the car wash would be more successful when it comes to open rates and things like that. But it's the Jiffy Lube that it is. Now, our company is one that doesn't, discount at the car wash we don't do coupons we don't do any of that um, if we had our offer a promotion offer it, we probably would see a higher uh, engagement rate but we we don't do it so uh, uh, that's probably leads into why Jiffy Lube does have a, a much better success rate or engagement rate you don't want to be giving stuff away every day too just right. to have people drive in again eventually it's just about you know what's the value that you're actually offering. You right. Know, and again, not just emailing to email it, you know, what are you actually offering people? And it goes back to like your whole, like, <clears throat> um, like what are you doing by discounting? You're driving traffic, but in a way are you devaluing, devaluing mm -hmm. your product? Um, I know a lot of times companies will look at price, how you price your product is marketing. Right. Again, like, Maybe you don't think it is, it is, right? I think it's very easy to say, all right, well, again, go to, let's go to the gym membership. This gym membership is $29 a month and our competitor down the street is $19 a month. It's easy to say, well, they're not coming because, or like people aren't signing up for our gym because it's so much cheaper at that. If price, if price is that important to people, then no one would drive Lexuses right. or BMWs. 
It's the value that you provide your customer. That's the most important thing. It's way more important than your price is that if you can actually provide a quality service and prove to them that you're worth that $29 a month or whatever it is, then the price isn't even an option, right? Make them have that. And again, that goes back to the experience they have. How good is their actual car wash? And like, how well is your equipment set up? What kind of products are you, what kind of chemicals are you using um, to clean the cars? Like all of that will define that. And if you have good equipment or um, whatever it is, if, you, if you're putting out a quality car and you're showing value that you can come every day, you're making that twenty nine ninety nine or whatever forty four ninety nine or whatever it is, people see value in it and they they'll stick with you. At one point, you have to have trust in your brand that this is what you're worth. Yeah. If you just start going down the road undercutting everybody, yeah. every it's just going to keep happening. And at what point? And then you know, at what point are you not even making right. money? I mean, right. you have to believe that if someone's going to go, if you're offering a twenty nine ninety nine service, you better make sure you're delivering a twenty nine ninety nine yeah. service. And if someone takes that nineteen ninety nine. You know, maybe maybe you lose them for a month, whatever it is, but eventually there's also a good chance that they'll tire of that service and, you know, be willing to spend yeah. the extra if they're getting use of it. So you really... There was... Um, I was reading a book. I can't remember the book. It was a marketing book. Um, and the example they used was there was a jewelry store. They... Um, like a mom and pop jewelry mm-hmm. store, very tra- uh, touristy area. And they had one product that they couldn't move. Um, and they were, uh, they were like going out of town or something. And the woman sent an email to like the assistant manager or whatever and said, you know, we're leaving, like, can you like move these, this product, you know, cut it, like make the new price, whatever this is. Right. Well, the woman, the, there was a typo in the email or the woman, um, uh, read it wrong. Instead of reducing the price, she raised the price by maybe like fifty percent. And then by the time the the owner got back, the product was gone. So what happened was people came in, they saw, oh, these are expensive. They must be good. There, this is real quality. Just by pricing correctly, they were able to sell this product. And again, it goes back to what you say. If you're all, if you're constantly just if discount or uh, a reduced price, if that's your marketing approach, it's just a race to the bottom. That's all it is. You have to find the value that you're providing your customer. And I know that when people hear the word value, they think discount or whatever it is. It's actually, are you providing a service? What you said, is your service worth what you're, what you're, um, uh, you're pricing at? And if you can prove over and over and over again that it is, you have nothing to worry about. All right. So looking ahead now and shifting a little bit here. So in the next little while here, we talked about opening the store in 2017. 2018 store opens in a different market in Binghamton yep. where you have one store in that market, not, not too far away. Then last year, another store opens in Latham. And now next year or this year, two stores opening in a completely different market where Hoffman Car Wash has no real footprint. How different does that look, setting that up, you know, looking at two new stores? Obviously, going through those openings, you've, like you said, you've worked through it now and know a lot, a lot has changed from 2017. How different is it going into a completely different market and, uh, you know, expanding to a completely different territory? Yeah, it's certainly interesting. Um, when we opened the store, uh, the second store that I was here, we were in that market with one other store. So we were kind of known, but not really. Now we're, you know, we're going an hour and a half west of Albany where the majority of our stores are located. And the great thing about Hoffman Car Wash in this market is the Hoffman name has been around since 1965. It's well known. It's established. Uh, And on top of that, the Hoffman family, like, so um, the cousins and, uh, you know, the whole, like, arc of the Hoffman family in this area are all entrepreneurs. They have different businesses or have dif- different businesses. And even though like uh, they might not even like see each other uh, and I'm talking like third cousins, right. like um, I-, I think people kind of 
have made the connection that or think that it's all so the Hoffman name is out there, right? Um, we don't have that in Utica, um, or where our new store is going to come. I think our company is unique in the sense that we're family owned, um, but we're still a large company. We have, I don't know, 700 employees. Right. So, how do you, um, we don't want to be the Walmart of car washes that comes to the, you know, you want to have that family feel to it, but you also um, want to kind of convey that uh, excellence of quality or whatever it's going to be. So I think our struggle is going to be how do you balance the two and how do you sell the kind of that family owned business story to all over again, right? Um, Because it's not like we're going to open a a building that is a rinky-dink building. Like, it's a large building, and it's going to have the latest and greatest uh, equipment, thanks to Innovate It. Um, So, you know, people are going to see this building. You know, what association are they going to have with it? It's up to us to tell the story of, the family and, and, uh, how, what car washing has meant to this area and to the family. And, and I think that's going to be the kind of the story that we need to tell. Um, and, t- uh, and on top of that, you know, we've identified a location obviously that could use a car wash. Um, so we also have to sell, maybe they're not used to getting their car wash once a week or whatever it is. Again, like selling the unlimited program and building that habit. I think another thing that Hoffman Car Wash does really well and has done well in this area, and I would expect the same happen out there, is the involvement in the community. Yeah. I think that's the reason a lot of people are also familiar with the brand is um, you know staying involved in a lot of community initiatives. And I would expect that would be the same. Yeah. Uh, Wes, that's another way, I think, kind of to tie your brand into something that's important to people out there. So you can see you're not just, like you said, not just Walmart or the car wash world. You're there to support, you know, the local infrastructure and to support the people yeah. locally as well. Yeah. A couple of years ago, um, I think one of the things that we identified that we could do better with is making people know how involved we are in the community. And it just so happened that when we were having these discussions, Tom Hoffman Sr., um, he was at a church ser- sermon or service or whatever, and um, the the preacher was talking about. Uh, I think it was a TED talk. It was think kindness and the importance of kindness. Well, that kind of like sent us down this rabbit hole. And and now you'll see if you come on our property, all of our, um, we changed a little bit, but all of our employees wear shirts and on the sleeve, it says practice kindness. So we've kind of adapted, adopted this practice kindness mentality. And, um, you know, we have buttons that we hand out and, and different things, but you know, it's, it's twofold, right? It it gives our employees. Uh, uh, you're literally wearing it on your sleeve, like that has some sort of psychological, logical impact on how you're interacting with customers. And I think it, in a way, like maybe you have a an angry customer, like maybe it disarms them a little bit because at the end of the day, it, it really is about empathy and and, and kindness and how you're treating people. Um, so you kind of get that at the store level, but on the, on the flip side of things, you know, we've done, we did a international women's day promotion this year. Um, we've done, we'll do two food drives where I can't even remember the, like how the amount of food that we collect and what it equates to actual retail price. It's, it's, it's incredible. Um, we do a veterans day event each year. Um, and then on top of that, you know, we're involved in JDRF and, uh, host a golf tournament that, you know, it, incredible the, the amount of money that we help raise for that organization. And then um, there's a, this is lack of a better term, a homeless shelter in Albany that we're very much involved with as well. Um, they do more than, um, it's more than just the homeless shelter. But um, these are things that, um, you know, again, maybe we don't necessarily broadcast too much, but it's, it's very important of like, you can do community events, and you could do these things, 
But if it's not actually part of your mission, then it's then it's not going to help you. Um, and and I know like, but I'm trying not to be disingenuous in, in what we're doing, but all these little things help improve your social standing, helps improve your brand. And if you're not sincere about what you're doing, people are going to see right through it, right? If you um, if you're doing a food drive and for just to get people on the property or whatever it is, people are going to see right through that. And it just, you're just wasting your time. Right. And that comes from consistency over time. People, you know, when you're constantly out there in the Mm -hmm. community, but if you think of yourself in kind of a one dimensional term that you're just a car wash, that's all you're ever going to be to people. So how else can you, I guess, you know, how else can customers see, you know, your involvement in in the community and what's going on? Being beyond that, I think is obviously what makes Hoffman car wash. It's a big part of what makes it unique and it only helps, you know, grow its standing in, in the community sure. itself. So obviously there's the value there. Sure. Wrap up here. Let's uh, talk your favorite tools right now as a marketer. You're always in you got your hands <laughs> in a million different things. I know there's always a tool of the moment for you. There is a tool of the moment. And I'm sure you Re- guys get sick of hearing <laughs> it. Uh, so resources, either whether that be reading, you know, whether it's on the digital side of things. And then um, any other tools too that you think are, are, are the top ones for you right now? Oh boy. All right. Well, let's start with, um, I'll start with books. I, I'm, I enjoy reading, probably don't read as much. I just read two books. Um, one would be radical candor. Um, and that is very much, um, talks about, you know, how to speak to people, like how to, not be passive aggressive, how to address, um, um, I don't, to be radically candor and you can be candid with someone and not be an a-hole. Right. <laughs> um, so that book was, was very good. Um, the other book I just finished is, is called, um, uh, be where your feet are. Um, it was written by Scott O'Neill. Scott O'Neill was the, up until yesterday, was the CEO of the Philadelphia 76ers, the New Jersey Devils, and basically all of um, Josh Harris and uh, David Blitzer's sports holdings. So Scott O'Neill was uh, essentially my boss at one point. Um, Not that I had many interactions with him. I had probably three I can count with. One of them was outrageous. And um, long story short, I was at a workshop and he was at my table. So the CEO of the the whole company is there. I completely was like so nervous and like that I kind of was, I wasn't paying attention and it kind of, I had to dig myself out of like a bit of a hole, but it all worked out. But I digress anyway. So, uh, that book was not what I thought it was going to be, but it was really good from a parent standpoint. You can't beat it. It's, it's about disconnecting and, and it truly being where your feet are and being mindful of that. So those are kind of the two books that I just finished reading. Um, from a tool standpoint, I'm very high. I love all of Adobe's um, software. I'm very high on XD right now. Uh, it's super lightweight. You can it's it's very much based for uh, uh, websites, apps, things like that. Uh, super lightweight, but you can really you can create images in it. Uh, super easy. And then to kind of go off of that, uh, Canva.com. Uh, again, you can create images and uh, so we kind of, they kind of go in hand in hand for us. And we were talking about the gifts for the teller screens was, so what we might do is, um, uh, create an ad, maybe it's five slides, uh, in XD, then we'll bring in the Canva, which can very easily take those five slides and kind of animate them and make them into a GIF. So if we were running a Facebook ad or whatever it is, and we wanted it to have motion, we'll, we'll kind of build off of it right there. Those are my two biggest um, things. Email marketing, we're currently, we use Active Campaign. Uh, we have been for probably the last three months. Uh, we were using MailChimp earlier and kind of felt like we outgrew it. Uh, Active Campaign, I would say that we probably are using like 30% mm-hmm. of its capabilities. Um, so something to, to kind of strive for. Uh, those are the big ones. Um, I'm trying to think what else would help people. Um, we use Fiverr for some freelance stuff, mostly like voiceovers. 
uh, for running commercials or, um, or maybe you need like to run an ad over the loudspeaker inside your full service Fiverr. Uh, we have like two actresses that we use one seven dollars like she's our if you call on your on the phone that's like the person you hear seven dollars for like 50 words and then we actually have someone if we have a commercial she's kind of become the voice of the hoffman car wash commercials i don't know with the commercial you have to buy the commercial rights to use it um i don't know it's probably 100 bucks for i don't know 100 words or whatever it is so it's a good option uh, and there's a ton of people on it for the most part. Um, uh, I would say I've, you know, I've had nothing but good experiences on it. So those are probably my, hopefully the big, um, big takeaways or big things that we're using. If I'm not like, if you're just an operator and you're looking for kind of a DIY type thing, I think Fiverr would be very helpful mm -hmm. for you and Canva, uh, a lot of pre-made templates and things like that. I will say just kind of avoid like getting caught doing what other people are doing. Maybe not necessarily another car wash, but like maybe that gym down the street has is using the same colors and the, or has the same picture, same stock photo or whatever it is. Just be mindful of that stuff. Well, I think that about does it, Kevin. Bittersweet to uh, day for you here <laughs> wrapping it up. Thank you for joining. Thank you for your work as yeah. a host and for turning that over and we'll, uh, hang your uh, microphone from the rafters when we're done here. <laughs> thanks again. Yeah. Dan, thanks for having me. Uh, I know the show's in good hands with you. And thanks to Lauren, who produces this as well. Uh, just excellent, excellent uh, job by both of you. Thanks. Well, that's it for today's show. Thank you again to Kevin Zlaznik for his work as the host on the Modern Car Wash podcast and for joining us today's guest, for handing this uh, ship over to me to take the helm. Um, as always, you can follow us, find us at InnovatedCarWash.com, on our YouTube channel, and of course, uh, anywhere you get your podcasts, find this podcast. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.